Max P, better known as the Florian guy. Uh, and this is Colors Are a Crutch. Uh, and we're going to be talking today about uh, what we're seeing the CDH meta do, specifically around tournaments. Um, you know, and there are three recent tournaments that I think uh, are pretty relevant and um, have affected the meta and what we're seeing. Those are the Cookout uh, Surfside over in California and Mox Masters August. Uh, but before we jump into all of that, um, so Max, what have you been up to lately? What are you brewing? What have you played in? What's going on? Yeah, lately, I mean, I mean, this last weekend was Mox Masters. Don't know when this recording will be released, but uh, I was fortunate to come in third place there. I'm sure we'll talk about that a little more when we get to that tournament. It was a really fun tournament day, uh, really relaxed environment, especially compared to my last chaos where I said it felt very sweaty. Here, I got to be a lot more relaxed, you know, bad loss in round one, two wins after that, tie, tie to just go into the top 16 and keep going from there. Playing Kitten again, right? Of course, of course. So, so no Ob Nixless. No, I'm... <sighs> I don't think I'm ready to do a tournament on Nick's Lewis. I, I really want to get a win on Kennen. I think I'm just going to keep going until I get one. Nice, nice. Are you brewing anything else right now? or just, just the... Working on some decks with some people. I, I tend to help a lot of people with their decks. People just ask for my input. So I do a lot of brewing on various strategies for that reason, but I tend to not actually throw them together because of my current situation in Costa Rica. It's hard to, hard to get cards and play new things. And OBS makes my computer run like a boiling volcano. So I can't just... Uh, Test nice. decks on Moxfield all day. Very nice, very nice. So, um, you know, me, I, I just played in in the cookout uh, down in Atlanta. Uh, didn't go as well as I'd like. I got a couple of wins, but couldn't convert into top 16. So, ah, uh, well, um, next time. I don't feel like uh, I did anything wrong. I didn't punt anything. You know, just, you know, the luck of the silence. So, um, just kind of yeah. how things go sometimes. Um, you know, Brew-wise, I am working on Talion like everybody and their mom. Uh, but I think I think that commander is going to be great. I'm very excited about it. Um, you can expect to see me playing it alongside Florian. It, it really feels like sort of the Yang to Florian's Yang. You know, very very different style of deck, and, and feels really good as like a you know a reliever for Florian. So I'm enjoying it. It's a two color deck, and I mean, obviously we're coming into this control meta partially based on the uh, the top four from Nimrus, which was a Demir deck. Do you think that Talion is just a better Nimrus? I do. And, you know, I didn't initially think it was that great, mostly because I didn't read the whole card. And it turns out reading the card explains the card. You know, the yeah. fact that uh, um, Italian triggers not only on um, spells with a particular CMC, but also any creature that matches the power or toughness of the number you name means it just draws so many, so many stinking cards. It's ridiculous. Um, so it's, it's, it's like a Rhystic Study in the Command Zone, which is just phenomenal. And my joke was always, what's the best deck in the format? The one that casts Eternal and Rhystic Study. Yeah. So this, this, this just does that. So it does the job. It's phenomenal. And, and, and Nimrus really, uh, you know, what Snake did with Nimrus really kind of paved the way for this whole archetype of just straight hard control, you know, sit there, play the game, take your time, you know, shut everyone down and then find your way to a win later. Well, it reminds um, me of, it, I had a, a high, not, not a high power, kind of a casual deck that was on the more competitive side of casual, but still not close to CDH. Uh, it was five colored Nib Misery Born. And I called it five colored Junt. Because the idea of Junt and Modern was one for one in your opponents into existence. And normally that's a strategy that can't function properly in Commander because you can't refill and one for one in everyone isn't gonna win you a game. But when you have a commander like the Mizzet that would just refill your hand and you could keep blinking Niv to keep refilling with all the best removal, similar to the way that Nimrus is gonna get you new cards into hand or the Talion's gonna get you new cards in hand, you can start to really embrace that control type. Yeah, and I think the other the other thing that's happening is there's sort of been a ubiquitous strategy um, that's kind of emerged in CDH, uh, you know, with Kinnon and Dawn Waker and um, Tyam, all of these decks that are essentially shut down by specific uh, stacks pieces. Um, mm -hmm. Curse Totem, Graft Digger's Cage, um, Weathered uh, Runestone, yep. um, which just, just are absolute houses against so many decks, including Florian for that matter. Yeah, um, <laughs> so, so, you know, Snake's whole philosophy was like, I want to play a deck that can play those cards. And yeah. Talion can do that, and Nimrus can do that. Um, and they're just extremely powerful effects in the format right now. I mean, almost um, every single card, every almost every single deck in the format is either a creature deck or a graveyard deck. There's almost, 
There's very few that aren't either of those. Uh, really your biggest competition of the top tier that you're gonna have to deal with is gonna be onboard Najila Beats or Tibbet if you're playing those cards. Yes, yes. Okay, but before we get too lost in, in specifically that deck, like, um, you know, why don't we go backwards? So you, you played the Mox Masters, August. What yep. was the meta like? Oh, do you want to start a Mox or do you want to go cookout forward? Uh, let's go backwards. Let's start with the Mox Masters. And, okay. Well, actually, you know what? I, I changed my mind. You know, because yeah. Mox Masters is much more entertaining because you did really well in that. And I did not do that well in cookout <laughs> or Surfside. So, yeah, let's go back. Let's go the other way. All right. So we'll talk about the cookout first. Sure. Um, so I, I played I played Florian there, obviously. Um, you know, the, the, the top, the, the winning the winning decks in this case were Kinnon and Kinnon, right? The two Kinnons in the top four. Uh, yep. There was another Dawn Waker deck there. And then there was Deverick. Uh, who famously won Mox Masters, we'll get to in a minute, on Najila. And I think those were those decks were very representative of the meta there. Um, you know, I saw a lot of Kin and a lot of Dawn Waker and a lot of <laughs> and a lot of um, Najila. I mean those were the decks that I saw. Saw a little bit of Tivit. You know, it was interesting because, you know, Swiss rounds were basically uh, two of those decks. So you either had a Najila, a Kinnon, or a Dawn Waker or both. Um, yep. Or I mean, or multiples, and then you had uh, a wild card deck. You know, something just completely out of the jungle. You know, someone from an LGS who brought something interesting to the to the tournament. Um, that was kind of the way things went. Um, and for the most part, what happened was those you know meta decks won most of the pods that they were in um, and converted over to top sixteen. I don't think there was anything crazy uh, in the top sixteen. Um, you know, we saw Dahada. I'm just trying to think, is there, is there anything? I mean, no, I if you, if, so if you look at the top 16, which thankfully EDA 16 has added this awesome meta breakdown thing. Uh, they've also added, if you go to a specific tournament's page, you can uh, immediately see the commander that each of the people were playing. You don't have to click on them anymore, which is a fantastic upgrade. Uh, so you can really quickly look at the top 16 and running through it, it's Kinnan, Najila, Kinnan, uh, Dawn Waker, Kenrith, Niv-Mizzet, Rog, uh, another Dawn Waker, Blue Farm, Najila, Tivit, Dihada, Eureka, Sisse, Blue Farm, Dargo Thras, and Tivit. Yeah. A, a very yeah. meta top 16. Really nothing incredibly shocking that made it there. Um, and again, nothing kind spicy. of yeah. reiterating what you say using the meta breakdown page, there were nine Kinnan entries, seven Najila entries, 15 Blue Farm, seven Tivit, seven Dawn Waker, another nine Rog Sai that didn't make any top 16s. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. it, it really, it was it was dominated by this top tier of decks that everyone was going for, and just not many other entries for wild cards. Yeah, all the wild cards just kind of basically got flushed out, you know. Yeah. Before, but I would say by the end of day one, most of the the, the wild card decks were flushed out, yep. um, you know, and, and out of contention. Um, but you know, it was it was a it was a great tournament. Had a great time. You know, Eminence does a great job always. Um, you know, next time I'm going to get him. Next time. Um, next time. Um, moving on to Surfside. Surfside, uh, unlike the cookout where everything was pretty straightforward, uh, was a jungle. I mean, it was some wild decks, you know, in that in that tournament. Um, you know, we saw Moira and Tashar in the top sixteen. Oh, yeah. We saw Sauron the Dark Lord. We saw Scion of the Ur Dragon. I mean, just absolutely wild decks that were there uh top four still kind of settled out to what you you know expect to see yeah you know tim necrom tim necrom kinnon again uh and rogsai yep so. i will say a very a very different kinnon deck though like when you go to the cookout both of those decks in the top four are very very similar to mine when you go to mox masters it's mine the the kinnon deck in the top four of surfside is a completely different strategy uh, really really did his own thing it's a list that Confuses me in a lot of ways, and I definitely have a lot of questions for him if I ever get to have a conversation with Owen. Um, but yeah, very much his own his own build of the deck. Yeah, but there's so many spicy decks. I mean, this is the California metaphor. I mean, you got you got two of the the Rog Tev, uh, you know, the T Rog uh, Poly Stacks decks. You know, kicking ass I think over it's, there. I think it's the best stack deck in the format. I believe that. I, I agree, 100 percent agree. And and Peter, of course, and Tyler both you know well-established pilots on the deck doing their thing um and we even see uh, oh my god bad dog in in ninth place with kalia so i love of... i love bad kalia dude that deck is awesome 
Yeah. So it plays really Doom interesting. Whisper. <laughs> so so you know we started this whole this whole podcast today talking about like how is the meta shifted? And I I, have, I look at this term, I have no idea. I yeah, just, I, I have mean, no idea. I mean, it's pretty. You get Atlanta, which I, I think was a more broadly advertised event. It seemed like more people traveled for it. I would say, um, which got you. I don't want to say more good players. The the California meta has a ton of good players, but I, I really think Surfside really was just the California meta versus Cookout was more of a broad meta. Is maybe a way to think about it. Yeah, I agree. And what's interesting is you know you have you know sort of the the champion of the East Coast meta, uh, Brian Koval, who actually did play in Surfside and just did not did not do well. Which I don't know what you know. I don't know whether his deck is tuned for East Coast or West Coast just kicks East Coast butt. I don't know. Um, but he had a much harder time on the West Coast than he did on the East, where he did well, top I, sixteen again at at, at uh, in Atlanta. Oh, he did. I thought he just missed it on Rock Side because there were zero no. Rock Sides in the top sixteen at the Cookout. No, he's on he's on Tim Necrom. You're probably thinking of. Uh, oh, sorry. You're thinking of the Epic Storm. You're thinking yes. of uh, Brian yes. Cook. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. Yeah, Brian Cook just missed it at, in at the cookout, but Koval crushed it in the Swiss and then lost in top sixteen at at uh, at the cookout. Gotcha, gotcha. And then he went. I don't know what he went. He went like oh and oh one and three or something like that um, at Surfside. So he did not do well there. Um, I don't know why. Pick, pick, pick what you will. Stack um, stacks, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> T Rog comes out and just kicks. You know, like, oh, you want to play Blue Farm? Yeah, no. Sorry. I mean, it, it really. <laughs> any deck that's trying to do anything turbo on a strategy, it, it eats it alive. You know, because you you need cards to go turbo. If you don't have cards, you can't do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. And if it gets the right starting hand, it doesn't matter what you have. You're done. You're it makes done so much deal. mana. So much mana. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, where's the hard control that we were talking about? I mean, I don't see it. And I don't see it in Surfside at all. None. Yeah. Nothing. Well, I can say, I, I did officially change the name of my deck list. It is not just Grind Them Into Dust anymore. It is now Grind Them Into Dust Cannon Midrange Control. Because yes. I am, I am, hey, I am hard locked on these cards now. Like Karn the Great Creator showed up again. It was fantastic yesterday. It's such a jank out card in the meta. It shuts down so many combos. It, it just doesn't let anyone do anything. Karn hits the board. You see everyone just get sad and you watch the life drain out of their hands as they set them <laughs> on the table. It is, it, it is so much fun. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. When, when it comes out, I'm playing Florian and I see Karn, I do get my soul does die a little bit. So. But that's the thing is, I, I think we've hit this place of such efficiency in win lines on decks that playing hard control can be difficult because when you're playing hard control, you normally cannot close out the game quickly. And if you give people continuous time and you're playing hard control, hard control rarely truly locks people out. It gives them multiple barriers to start doing something that makes it feel difficult, but it's still doable if everyone is allowed to continue playing the game to get to that position. And I think when you look at a deck like Kinnon, and I think one of the reasons that Kinnon has done so well in this meta is because we do play a lot of hard to deal with control functioning threats that are very tempo-y, very slow you down, give you these barriers to go. So, but we are a deck that has turbo win lines. We are a true mid-range shell that can take on both turbo and stacks identities. And even when we're in a stacks identity of locking out the game, we can close out the game very, very quickly. Right, now I know you love to talk about Kinnon, so. Uh, you know, just a, a little slight segue into you know something else that we've talked about outside of this podcast, which is you know, what I call the rise of Kinnon and and how it's kind of past uh, Dawn Waker uh, oh, yeah. in prevalence. And you know, why don't you? Uh, I know you you, you can. You could talk about that, so I'll let you. I'll let you go. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Don Waker's name also changed. Uh, it's no longer called Don Waker more. It's called Bad Kinnon. Uh, <laughs> people used to sing I dude I used I used to think Don Waker you know that meme of I don't remember it is some some person holding his girlfriend's hand he's looking behind them at some other yes, girl yes yes yeah that mean yeah. that used to be me I felt like when I was playing Ken and I play against Don Waker I'm like oh you're me but you get to play Dockside and Ranger Captain and Deflecting SWAT and all these awesome cards that I don't get access to and then I realized that Kinnon just holds my hand so much more firmly than that other woman ever could. You know, <laughs> he's, he's really, <laughs> he's the all-star oh, you need. It, every, every Dawn Waker deck is just a secret Kinnon commander deck anyway, who cares? Or maybe they're a secret Dockside commander deck, but 
you know, it, it's whatever at that point. There's so many four color piles and four colors can breed inconsistency. And Kinnon is consistent in its flexibility with inconsistency. I, I love the deck to pieces. And yeah, I think, I, I do think people have really encompassed, um, not encompassed, that's the wrong word. People have really taken a harder look at what I'm doing with the deck since my first stop four a few months ago and how I've continued to develop the list since then. Uh, and people have really come around to this this strategy I've put for it where it is this, this mid-range deck, this I'm gonna make your life difficult control deck. I have all the silver bullets to make your life hard. It's more built around not losing to the fast matchups because it's already favored in the mid game. But then I, I threw in all these artifact tutors so that I'm a control deck that can still win quickly. And I can still just like explode one turn out of nowhere and people aren't prepared for it. Even when we talk about, you know, the, the finals game I'm sure we'll get to here, I looked like I had nothing going on. If it gets back to my turn there, I win the game. It's <laughs> like this, this deck can do things when you don't expect it to do things. And compared to Dawn Waker, Dawn Waker, it's only explosion is Dockside. If they're not doing Dockside combos, it's normally pretty predictable what they're going to be going on. They're well, trying to grind advantage with Thrasios. They're trying to creature tutor into Dockside. Well, that's not fair. I mean, sometimes they put uh, Kinnon into play, and then they do things then, right? Yeah. Just, okay, it's, it's explosive when the game creature combos, though. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And, but it's interesting because, you know, like you said, back in, what, April, you know, April, June time frame, I mean, Dawnmaker was by far the premier sort of Simic um, dick uh, in, on the scene. And Kinnon was sort of an afterthought. And that has absolutely swapped positions at this point. You know, Kinnon is, is doing much better uh, in terms of tournaments. And uh, Dawnmaker has taken the back seat. Yeah, I mean, um, people, people thought it was... Hot Mardu summer. It is tropical yes. Simic summer. It is about <laughs> to enter. It is about to enter Nezahal fall. After that, we have void winter or winter. And just when you think the seasons are gonna stop being blue and green, it's gonna become consecrated Sphinx spring, and we're coming back. Like it, Kinnon it. is Kinnon is here to stay. Kinnon is, I think, one of the best decks in the format. I think right now it, it goes at this point. I think we're better than Rogsai. Uh, I think we're better than Blue Farm, honestly. I think it's. I think Najila and Tibbet are the best two decks in the format, and I think if you have a top tier pilot, Kinnon is number three at this point, is where I put it. Mm, interesting. I, I mean, I, I think I wouldn't count out Blue Farm just yet. I mean, I think Blue Farm is sort of the, continues to be the jack of all trades, master of done deck. You know, when it's, you know, all things are, are equal, I think it's going to do quite well, but I think. I think you're right. The Kinnon is more explosive, yep. um, and and more dangerous. And uh, you know, it can come out of nowhere and just win games. Yep. Um, so you know. So so with that being said, you know, talk about Mox Masters and um, you know how did Kinnon play? What happened in the finals? You know, what the deck played. Deck played so good, it, which, which felt nice because it. They did make it hard on me, which we'll talk about in a sec. But a lot of my previous tournaments on Kinnon, when, I, when I'm playing Kinnon casually with friends, I feel like I, I keep a seven or a six every single game. I almost never multi five. I never ever have to go lower than that. The deck, I trust in the deck, and the deck rewards me for trusting in it. Is normally my relationship with it. Mox Masters, uh, it flipped that. It, 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 or no, normally it flips that. This time though, it, it treated me well, except round one. Round one had me worried. I was fourth seat in round one against our buddy, uh, Keelan. And I had to mold a four in fourth seat on Kennen, which is something I almost never do. I normally am willing to keep any five card hand just because it's so bad to mold a four in Kennen. Uh, and that was a quick loss. Didn't really care about that one. But I was like, all right, bad start to the day. Uh, round two then, didn't decide to put me in better seating, put me in third seat this time. I was able to grind out an awesome win against uh, Blue Farm deck in first seat, Elcha deck in second, me in third, and Bihada in fourth. Uh, our buddy Clutch Crit and uh, was able to copy an Elsha with a Phyrexian Metamorph and really grind out advantage from there. Hit a few key, pe key pieces of interaction off the top uh, and was able to go for an instant speed win on top of his Breach line because I hit Transmute Artifacts as the top card of my library, which felt really, really good. And then nice. round three, yeah, round three was a Kin and Mirror match. I was in third seat again, dude. They did not want to give me good seating today. I went 4-3-3 three, three for my first three games. I was against my buddy William in the second seat on a more turbo Kin and build. He got off to a much faster start than me. It was really scary. Uh, first seat was on Tibbet. Fourth seat was on Tim Najeska. Tim Najeska in fourth seat tried to go for a Citadel line with Citadel in the graveyard, Memnite in the battlefield, Goblin Engineer to sack it. Me and him both had a Kinnon spin up. I convinced him to hit, to, you know, he's first in priority, spin his Kinnon first. He hits a Wandering Archaic. I was like, oh, perfect, because I had this Pongify in my hand. 
and I was debating whether I needed to kill his kinnon. So I said, cool, let me pongify your kinnon. I'm not going to pay for wanting archaic. You can deal with the problem. Oh, uh, so brutal. And I, I, people do that. Oh, God. <laughs> You're that guy. Oh, my I, God. I, I am, I am that guy. guy. I, I repeatedly did that to him the entire game. My, my Tide Spout Tyrant got Gilded Drake by Tivit. And if Tivit untapped, he was going to win the game. And I looked at him, I said, you understand that Tide Spot Tyrant's a problem? He said, yeah, I know Tide Spot Tyrant's a problem. I said, okay, I'm going to mini rift your cannon. I'm going to not pay for wanting our kick. Oh my God, you're a terrible person. Yeah, I am. Truly I am. a terrible person. I am. Uh, <laughs> we're in a tournament though. We're there to win. We're there to play correctly. Uh, that game I have recorded. So that one I think I will be throwing up on YouTube and adding to the kid and primer. Um, Tivit player really fucked that game up though. They... <laughs> Maybe the worst turn I've ever seen. They stole my Tide Spout Tyrant, and then they made infinite mana. They started the loop, though, with Enlightened Tutor, and they only had one minute floating, so they couldn't pay for the Wanderer Cake, so they let him just put Basalt on top of his library. And then they made infinite colorless oh, no. mana and just passed. <laughs> oh, no. I, was like, I was like, what the fuck are you doing? They knew I had a Void Winner in hand that they had already bounced. My first kid in spin this game was a Void Winner, by the way. It felt great. And... Uh, yeah, so he bounced my Void Winner. If he just if he just holds the Tide Spot Tyrant, waits till the end step before his turn, he knows I'm gonna replay Void Winner. If he just plays Enlightened Tutor, bounces the Void Winner, and then wins on his next turn, I think he has that game pretty locked up, but he messed it up bad. Yeah. Uh, but that game, awesome. I got to grind it out there. Uh, ended up with uh, Seedborn and everything going on. You know, did the whole cycle, trying to grind everyone out, and then was able to close out the game pretty comfortably. And from there, yeah, rounds four and five, uh, both were just ties. Round four, I felt bad, because a lot of the guys that were in my round four game that we agreed on the tie, because we were all 10 points and 11 points, um, they ended up getting paired down to games they had to play, and they missed the top 16 because of that. Uh, rough. I was I was fortunate that I was just in a pod that was totally cool to just tie again. So I got like two hours off. First game, I mean, the round four we played a game for fun. That was against Snake and Deverick and all those guys. It was a good, good fun game. Uh, and then round five, I just went and swam with my dog for, for like an hour and came back. <laughs> it, was, it was a good time. Nice. But then top, I think that's one of the most important things to do in like a tournament is you know when you get a chance, walk away from yeah. the computer, walk away from the tournament, go do something outside, take a breath. You know, get something to eat, get something to drink, because you will wear yourself out quick. I mean, maybe, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit older than you, so maybe I wear out faster, but I, I know if I don't do that, I am useless in the later rounds, for sure. I'm, I, I'm, t I'm pretty good at staying on for a long time and staying locked in. And I swear to God, on, on Saturday morning, I woke up out for blood. I, I, t I called my shot, I texted my friends, I like woke up, I checked Facebook, and I just like hit a Facebook reel, scrolled to the second video, and it was this awesome gangster rap of like Patrick killing SpongeBob and people. And I was just like, this is it. This is the energy that I'm bringing today. And I said this to my friends, and I was like, anyone who plays me is fucked. I'm top four in this bitch. And I called it, and I did. Um, <laughs> and, but it was it was it was a really good time. The top sixteen match uh, felt good. I watched that, that was, game by the way. I watched yeah. that game. What, what what was your what was your perspective from watching it? How did how did it look? Uh, I felt bad for Hebrew Hercules. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he, he, you know, that, that silence was an interesting, like, so f for those who didn't watch it, basically what ended up happening was uh, Hercules, who was playing, he was playing uh, Tim Nadargo, right? Um, he was, he was my round one loss too. <laughs> yeah. I was on the so he was on Tim Nadargo and uh, he put a win attempt on the stack. Um, everyone knew that you had the win. Uh, in hand, like it was, it was clear to anyone watching that that game was over. If it got to you, that game was over. Um, and Hercules put a win attempt on the stack, and uh, the other player I don't remember what he was on uh, cast a silence Damn it. and yeah. and shut off shut off Hebrews uh, win attempt. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion about king making, whether that was king making or not. Um, and it's it's a you know it's a difficult question. Like my perspective, you can tell me yours in a second, but my perspective sure. is. Um, you know, active player, you have an opportunity to stop them. Um, you know, you kind of have to weigh whether or not there's any chance um, someone could punt their win attempt or, you know, whatever, and then make a decision about whether to, whether to cast your spell or not. And, you know, I don't know that there's always a right or wrong answer to that. Um, so it's, it's tough. It's always sucks to be on the receiving end yeah. of that situation. I've been on it a few times. Um, but it's, you know... You got to make a call, um, and I don't think there's a wrong call there. What do you think? 
I mean, I think well, one, of the, one of the advantages of Kinnon is we don't generally get messed up in those scenarios because our deck relative to other decks is much less deterministic. It is like, in, in my situation in that game, I had one ring, Seedborn Muse, tons of mana. I was, I was set up to absolutely dominate that game. But Kinnon is all just non-deterministic value. It doesn't just slam win cons on the table the same way a lot of other decks do. And sometimes that gives you that edge case of technically my odds are better with him in a quote unquote king making scenario. What you guys as the viewers couldn't hear that game was the actual table talk. Um, and I think right. Hebrew, I think Hebrew could have played this a little bit better. Uh, his, his Discord name is Hebrew Hercules if we refer to him by that name as well. But uh, when I asked him what he was trying to do, he did, he did say, he said, I don't exactly have it in hand. So he didn't, you know, say like, oh, I have the win in hand or didn't say like, I for sure don't have it. But the conversation is, they immediately tried to steer it as, are you trying to stop wounded or are you trying to win? And he said, I'm trying to catch up to wounded and if I can win, I'm gonna win, <laughs> is, is how he phrased it. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think that's yeah, what- The correct I, answer is if anyone ever asks you, are you trying yeah. to stop someone? The answer is yes, I'm yes. going to stop them. The answer is yes, I'm trying to By stop winning, wounded. but you say that part in your head. Yes, and so this was with a Grand Abolisher on the stack is when the conversation happened, which I could answer any spell that wasn't a creature, but I could not answer a Grand Abolisher. Um, so that was that was the struggle. So what happened with the Grand Abolisher on the stack, uh, Temujin on Tibbet in second seat passed, me in third seat, Hadley had to pass, and then we were then had this conversation and TTC started by Chaos Warping, the professional face breaker, tried to take him up some card advantage there because that's what we thought we had. We didn't think Temujin had anything the way he was passing on it, which we find out later, Temujin had a potential win line in hand that was gonna be very difficult to get past me, but maybe with the silence and some other things, it's, there was like a level of possibility to it. Um, so then the conversation once again was, are you trying to win? And he said, if I can win, I'm gonna win. And so Temujin said, okay, and threw the silence on the stack. Cause he had the time Steven in hand. He had another couple of counter spells in hand. So that's, that's what he was going for with that. Um, but yeah, right. so with the silence landing, uh, Hercules was able to just pass the turn. Uh, Temujin untapped, couldn't really do anything. I drew another 15 cards or whatever off the one ring in, in his turn and in my next turn. Spun into a Tide Spout Tyrant on Temujin's end step, which I will say when I, I did tell them during Hebrew's turn when the Grand Abolisher was on the stack, I as of now do not have to win at hand. And I obviously understand I'm gonna draw 15 more cards and I'm gonna get another Kinnon spin or two. But at that exact time, I was being honest. Like I know, I know, I know. Like, I, know. Saying, like I have an odd, I have an ad nos. It's not yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. have a win hand, I just have an ad nos. For sure, no, 100%. <laughs> but but, I, but it, it was a fact, at that time, I actually didn't yet have a win line. Uh, the Tide Spout made it easy. You know, Tide Spout made it super, super easy. Uh, before then, I would have had to go through a weird couple of tutors to make it work, but I, mm -hmm. I think I could have gotten a line if I didn't have the Tide Spout. I think I still would have been able to win, but that made it a lot cleaner. Um, so yeah, I was able to win that game, uh, move towards the finals against our buddy Devrick, who had just an awesome, awesome start on Najila on the play. I mean, really one of the one of the cleanest Najila wins I think you'll ever see in your life. It was just turn one Najila, turn two Ristic, turn three win the game. Super, super clean. Um, and used all five colors, which is something the casters for playing with Power pointed out that I really, I really enjoyed when I went back and watched it. Najila's red, Enlightened Tutor was white, Ristic was blue, Worldly Tutor was green, Grim Hireling was black. This man just used the whole color pie in three turns and won the game. <laughs> It was sick. It was fun. It was fun watching that game too because you know he put the uh, he put the grim hireling on the stack and I knew it was over. I yeah. knew it. Like it was one of those like you just have you just you, know, you could feel that nobody had anything to stop it. Like there's just there was no way. He, he well, the second seat Najila did have the force of will. He had right, but no blue card. He didn't have a blue card, right. and so Corvald cast Noxious Revival just because there were two Ristic studies. The, the the second turn cycle went Dev on end step cast Enlightened Tutor untapped cast Rist or er, not an end step on his upkeep cast Enlightened Tutor plays Ristic Study Najila two plays Ristic Study goes to my turn I cast Kinnon tap my Elf just to pay for Dev's Ristic Study give the other Najila player draw um, and then Corvald feeds them each two cards plays a Wish Clock gives me the Wish Clock which on my board is two lands and an Elf. And I have, and Kinnon, and I have a treasure vault in hand. So I actually have a direct win line there if it gets back to me, which is why this this hurt a little bit that he didn't top deck the blue card. Because in conversations with Dev after the game, he did not have anything to back up the Grim Hireling. If that top card of uh, Najila number two's library was a blue card, then he would have been able to counter the Grim Hireling and the game would have continued. Right, right. So, I mean, good job, Ben. You top four, can't complain. Can't uh, complain, can't complain. Yeah, and, and I don't think you did anything wrong in that game, right? You just had it. Yeah, what are you going to do? Happens. What are you going to do? Yeah.
Yeah, well, how is the rest of the meta? I'm, look, I'm kind of looking through it. There's some spicy decks in here. I see uh, uh, in the top 16, I see Braids, or is it Nightmare? Yes, there are some cool ones. And I see Rionia. Yeah, so get, reading it through really quickly for the viewers, it went Najila, Najila, Meon Kinnon, Korvald is the final deck in the top four. Then we had Dargo Timna, our buddy, coming at five, Kess six, Ikra Krom, uh, with the guy who previously won on Najila coming at number seven. Eureka, Tibbet, Atraxa, Blue Farm, Braids at 12, Rogsai 13, Tibbet again 14, Rionia, TTC, Thunder Conductor at 15, and then another Rogsai deck at 16. It's pretty nice though to see this, um, it's a little bit of boost for Rogsai after what happened at the cookout. We're not a, you know, nine entries, not a single one top 16s. My buddy's a main Rogsai player. He said the Adnaz Discord was freaking out. What do we got to change? What are we doing wrong? And then immediately they, <laughs> they win, they win Surfside and then they have two top 16ers at uh, Mox Masters. Has to feel like a good rebound there. Yeah, I mean, I think that deck is still solid. I don't care oh, what anyone says. It's so good. It's a good deck. It's just a good deck. It's a glass um, cannon, but. It, it, you know, it, it, you know, it does its thing. You know, when you watch people play Rock Side, you get these explosive turns yeah. that either result in a win or they're just done, um, yeah. which is a fun way to play. Um, you know, that's. But I, was, I, I think Snake said because Snake was on Rock Side. He was the guy who came in in uh, 13th place, I think. I think his name is Alex, and uh, he said in the entire tournament he played about like seven total turns. Yeah, <laughs> 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 like, like, so much like sense something so, so, much like sense, yeah. like it was either he either didn't get his third turn or he won on turn two like every game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. solid. <laughs> yeah, so that deck's all. We're gonna see. We're gonna continue to see rock side. It's not going yeah. anywhere. No, for sure. Um, and Tivitz ever present at this point yeah. i see it in every single top 16 i think we're only going to see more of it i see more and more people picking it up too like what's the uh you know the if you look at the the total you know top list tivit is oh, ranked yeah. third right now on top 16 in terms of but it gets uh, so many entries at this point oh, it gets, yeah it's it gets catching more, up though. i mean it gets more than blue farm at this point well blue farm is 253 total entries tivit is 133 but if we look at the tournament date and change it yeah. to say, let's say the last three months. So we'll go to May 1st. Yeah. So we'll go to May 1st. Uh, so we see Timna Krom still in the lead with 109 okay. entries, but Tivit's right behind at 90. Yep. Right. So yep. you can see, uh, you know, the meta shift here. That Tivit is becoming more and more and more prevalent, you know. And one of the reasons is, you know, Tivit. You know, we talk about hard control. It's Tivit good. can play that game. Yeah. No. Um, I mean, it, it's a deck with. It, it's a Nimrus deck that can close out the game really cleanly. Yeah. My my buddy Micah likes to call it the best stacks deck in the format. Is it a stack so deck though? Really? It's, I, it's not. A, it's a mid range the control. I mean, deck. That's, yeah. I mean, that's the that's the joke. That's the joke. Is it's not yeah. a stacks deck. But it kind of is. It, it, it can do some stacksy things really well. Hey, but um, I will say my my first ever tournament on Kinnon when I got into the format was Mox Masters May. And if you're looking at May onward, Kinnon actually gets bumped up to number four. Ah, uh, from when? <laughs> when did you say? From, uh, so I did from from May first, twenty twenty three onward is where we're currently. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's where I am too. I see Kinnon yeah. at four. Kinnon's yeah, Kinnon's which, which four. is funny because look at look at where uh, Bruce Thrasios is now, thirteenth. Oh, really? Oh, that's bad. <laughs> and it, with a, with a terrible conversion rate, ten percent, ten point five percent conversion rate. Yeah, versus Kenan looks like it has a terrible conversion rate, but since now it's actually over twenty percent in that time frame, which is yeah. Cool. Yeah, the only deck that's uh, ahead of it in conversion rate in, in in that top like you know tier there is uh, Nagila. I think one of the things you have to also look. Oh, at... Rogsai. No, I take that back. Yeah, Rogsai. Rock, Rogsai. Like Rock yeah, well, yeah. so here's the thing with Rogsai. I've looked at this forever, which I'm just gonna I'm just gonna reset this to go back to the base settings of the last year for a second. So you know, Rogsai's back in fourth, Kinnon's back in fifth. If you click on Rogsai and you look at how the deck is performing, let's compare top fours to top sixteens here. Rogsai in the last year only has three top four performances, and mm -hmm. then numbers six through twenty five are all at least tenth place in a tournament. Compared to Kinnon which only has 21 top 16s in the last year, but it goes one, two, two, three, 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 four, 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 nine top fours in the last year, you know, another six or whatever before you get to number 10, 
and then only our well, number 15. But how many of those are, are Pingmeister, Pong, and you? Most of them. But like, it's it, Kinnon is performing in a, at a top four quality at a much, much higher rate than the other decks right now, or yeah. than Rogsai specifically. Rogsai is a deck that can just snipe Swiss rounds because when you're in the Swiss rounds, you're not always against these really meta top 16 level pods. And some of those decks are not prepared to deal with the Rogsai deck. And you can just easily just gun them out on turn two, no matter what your seed order is half the time. Yeah, yeah. But so then, that, that kind of that kind of brings me to the next question, though. It's like, okay, so like you said, this is the the tropical Mardu summer or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> tropical um, Simic summer. Yeah, tropical Simic summer. Yeah. yeah. You know, so what happened to the Mardu summer? Did, you know, if we look at the if we look at the start of the summer, so if we look at you know June first, uh, and we look at are we looking for Mardu? I see Dahada at tenth, and that's the only Mardu deck I see. I'm uh, scrolling down, I'm scrolling down, looking for more Mardu. Uh, I mean, it's Timna, Dargo, Jessica, Timna. and Dihada are the two we're looking for, really, right? Yeah, Timna, Jessica. I don't see Timna, Jessica at all in the summer. In top 16. I'm looking, I don't see it. Okay, so I'm looking at... Down June, to 30. June 14th onward. I've got Dihada at number 7 on that ranking. Uh, it has five top 16s out of 18 entries. I mean, Dihado is, yeah, but Tim Najeska was supposed to be, I think, better than this. Yeah, I, mean, I don't see Tim Najeska. I see it at number 29. It has one top 16 out of 14 entries. Um, that was Derek Harris. I don't know, like, like Jessica Tim is a great deck. Um, I think it has fallen almost into the fallacy of, like the advantage of Mardu is also going fast. You know, it has all of the black tutors, it has all of the explosive win conditions, you lose out on the brain freeze lines, but you know, it becomes breach.deck in a lot of ways that can just explosively win the game. I think Tim and Jessica might have leaned too hard into being a mid-range Mardu deck instead of just being this explosive turbo deck. Uh, and I think Dihada does a much better job of just being, I am underworld breach.deck, I'm going to win the game yes. and not care what you are doing. And Dihada, the mana advantage of Dihada is wild. It is, I mean, you know, people incredible. rave about Rograk being a free commander. Dihada, yes, it's four mana and three colors, but it's a free commander. It gives you back four treasures immediately. Well, it's wild. I, and, and the synergies, the synergies it packs with things like uh, Magda uh, mm -hmm. and Bolas and Citadel, being able to yep. pull it back from the graveyard. Those synergies are incredibly powerful. I, you know, so I think, I think, I think we need to rename the Mardu Summer and just call it the Hada Summer. Because it's it's been the rise of Dahada as a real deck, uh, and not really the rise of Mardu as a color combination as much as it is Dahada. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, and it that's is... not to say anything bad about Timna Jessica. I love yeah. Timna Jessica is one of my favorite decks. Don't get me wrong, but it it like I don't think it's particularly strong right now, uh, with everything else that's going on. Whereas you know Dahada kind of gets around the Nimrus you know hard control just by being so freaking fast it just doesn't care. It's explosive. It's very, very explosive. It is the time of the evil granny. Because that's what she yeah. is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, Dihada, I remember the first time, because my, my main pod that I play with the most is I'm against Rogside Dihada. And when Dihada first, my buddy first started playing that deck, you know, my eyes were always first focused on Rogsai. That is priority number one. And when I'm in a pod with both of them, Rogsai is still priority number one in my head. But Dihad is priority like 1.2, 1.3. I still have it right there. I respect the deck so much more than I initially did because it can just go nuts. <laughs> like, like just, oh my God, you just play Dihada, flicker Dihada, suddenly you have six mana, you're just, you're going off. That's insane. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's, 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 it's rough to play against sometimes because you just don't get another turn. Yeah. Like, uh, and they just go off and just they just keep going and there's nothing you can do about it yeah. um and it's remarkably resilient i mean all those white spells you know being able to silence the blue player and, and just get there it's just it's just a damn good deck i mean it shows yeah. the importance of graveyard hate i i really think like one of the reasons kinnon is doing well in this meta is i think we have a, we have multiple answers to graveyards which has been really really yes. important like I, I have a meme i posted with my buddy where he, he was complaining about all the cards and so you know that meme where it's like someone pointing a gun at a person someone's pointing a gun at them from behind etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah yeah so yeah. I, I have i have that one though where it's it's uh, it's my buddy my buddy rooney is the guy and then it's the first person's armored scrap gorger and then it's Karn the great creator and then yes. it's endurance and then the guy in the corner is mind break trap <laughs> Just like... nice yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, nice. Um, 
Yeah, that all makes sense. Um, you know, so you could run half of you know, that, that. Kind of brings me to the other the other question I was going to ask is about Mox Masters. Is what happened to Tyam? Oh, my! Uh, I, I am a fish, I'm the number one Tyam hater. That's my profile on Discord says now. Uh, what happened to Tyam is they took 15 minutes off the clock and they couldn't win a fucking game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it was interesting. I heard that I heard that there you know the Tyam deck that did do well was running like uh, Abdel um, and doing yep. like Abdel Necromancy. You know things to try to yep. speed up their game plan, um, but other than that, like I don't think Time did anything in this tournament. No, um, you know, which is really interesting to me. Now you know those guys are really determined. Uh, I can't imagine Tuca and Pixel being like, "Oh well, I guess Time's not good anymore. Move on." No, they're yeah. gonna double down and triple down. We're gonna see Time again. I think if you look at the stats, they technically each got a win, but a lot of those I think were garbage games in round five. <laughs> like it wasn't yeah. you know the important ones that matter. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of ties. So if you go to the meta page chart, I think it was one of the better time decks had three ties in it or something like that. Jeez. <laughs> so, so did 75 minutes feel okay? Was it too... I was fine with it. I, it was a little frustrating. My round three match, uh, the Tim Nijeska player was like evidently stalling. Like I've, I've rewatched the video of that game and the amount of times this person was like, wait, let me think, asked about cards in graveyard, asked about cards in hand, and they would say, okay, I passed it like four times and would like purposely do it really slowly. Um, it definitely felt like people were quicker to go for stalling for ties in a lockboard state because it was more likely to occur. That's something I could say was a little bit noticeable. Uh, overall though, I loved it. Like we were, we were done with round four at like noon, my time, which felt great. It did seem like it, it went pretty fast. I mean, yeah. my experience in Mox Masters, I've only played in Mox Masters once. It was in July. And I had zero wins. I had one loss and I had three ties before I dropped. And it was just stacks misery. And I was like, why am I, why am I even bothering? Like, this, is, this sucks. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to see that things sped up a little bit. And the stacks decks were kind of, you know, I hate to say it, but pushed out a little bit, you know, just because... You know, it's just not fun. I hate. I hate. I hate. <sighs> I think. I think stacks are still very important to have a healthy meta. I think they're a really, really good thing to have around, and I think they need to be a present threat because otherwise, turbo is going to go a little off the rails. Um, sure. But if it's going to be a stack deck, I'm happy it's not tie him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Sorry, Zed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorry. They know I hate their deck. I, I was I was in a, I was in a brewing session with Tyam like last night just to like see what there was anything to do to improve the deck. But like I don't I don't know. <laughs> you just sitting there spying on them looking for no no no. I was helping out. I, I I gave oh, my sure you okay okay no no, no, sure, no. I gave you sure were. I'm more than happy to brew. I like brewing. I'm more than happy to help. But I, yeah, I told them before I left. I was like, all right, I gotta go, guys. I hope this deck never wins the game. But you know, see you later. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. I think Tyam said the number one like Discord name change is Tyam something. Like yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the righteous pather of Tyam. Just oh, because I. Did, did you yeah. see my 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 name in one of our other Discords now? I am. No, I'm, what was it? I, I've swapped it to I, I am Satellite Destroyer of Abzan. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. 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 Fuck you, Tyam. <laughs> <laughs> fuck that deck, dude. Fuck that deck. Such yeah. a piece of nightmare beast bullshit. All right. So are we gonna are we gonna see it again? Is it gonna come back or, or are we are we are we I think I think we're gonna see it come back. Uh, and I mean for the conversations I've been having with some time people, I think maybe get ready for them to start running stuff like Necropotence to have the ability to just explode out of nowhere. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. Uh, I guess we'll see if anything comes out in Wilds of, Wilds of Eldraine to help them out. I'm sure there'll be something. Yeah, they're going to run that new four mana black tutor. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a, I'm running that in Florian. Get a wall of roots. Hurt. That card looks great. <laughs> four, four mana, put a wall of roots in a black. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that kind of brings us to what, I mean, what's next? What, what, you know, what do you think the meta's going to do? And what do we, how do we get ahead of that? I mean, people are are actually planning for kin decks now, which I don't like as much. Uh, I've had I've had a lot of decks start adding in curse totem against me in my in my you know local quote unquote online meta that people I normally play with, which uh, respect, I'll take it. Uh, I think that is generally going to be a thing, though. I mean, you still saw a turbo deck win again. So you saw, I mean, the last two tournaments, you see it be Najila, which is a turbid range deck. You know what I mean? Uh, and you get Rogzai, which is a true turbo deck. And then you get Kinnon, which is kind of a mid-range stacks turbo deck. It's kind of fucking everything. Who knows? 
Um, but you're, you're seeing a lean towards speed and explosion, which I think is gonna have a natural response towards people trying to shut that stuff down. And I think they're gonna keep trying these like Nimrus style control decks. I think Talion is gonna be a huge bump for that archetype. I think there's gonna be a ton of people playing Talion when he comes out. When is the official release of Throne of Eldraine? September 1st is Wild. the pre-release, which is when the things will be legal. Okay, September 1st, huh. Yep, yeah, but I will be playing Talion, so get ready. I'm so prepared. I would, I would like to help you brew that deck. I also want to play Talion. I love control decks. Yeah, it's gonna be great. I, I just, you know, I hate the fact that everyone's gonna be wanting to play it too, so I won't be that unique anymore. But no. I, I don't care. I'm, I'm brewing it independently. I don't care. It's gonna be great. Gonna and be I'm great. sure, I'm sure the audience will be curious. Uh, what number do you name Italian if you play it? Like, there's only one. one choice. There's only one choice. It's two. Always two. It's two. Okay. Always two. Yeah. You, you never name anything else. Well, uh, so, unless you're, unless you're, uh, go ahead. You were gonna say it. Go ahead. The spark double and the. Sakashima. Sakashima, yeah, yeah. Then, then you, you name, name one and two. I love. Someone told me they were like, if you get if you get Talion, Spark Double, and Sakashima, and you name one, two, and three, someone plays a Draineth Magistrate, you draw three cards. You know, yeah. like that's <laughs> yeah. wild. But yeah. so two, Although, two is better you, than one, though. Yeah, but if you also if you do Sakashima on two and you do uh, Spark Double on two, you still also draw three cards. Yeah, because right, each one triggers independently. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, you could just pick the same number. You okay, keep so that's two. that's a, that's a good point. <laughs> is it better to keep picking two than to pick two and one? I think so. I think even yes, I think so. Interesting. I would have thought it's better to pick one and two. Yeah. Huh. I mean, I, I could see a case for picking one. It's a lot of if ones. you're at a, a, a very blue table and you're expecting lots of one mana counter spells. I mean, if you go to, what's a, like, let me look at Kinnon real quick. What is our, we have more twos than we have ones, that's for sure. Of course. That's yeah. that's Kinnon, though. Let's take a look at, uh, let me go to EDH. Well, what about your interaction suite? What's your interaction suite look like? Uh, okay, so there's, if you break it down on Moxfield, there's 15 permanents with a mana value of two, there's five spells with a mana value of two, and then I have 10 spells with a mana value of one. Right. So interaction. So I think all the interaction. I think interaction one is better for interaction. Yeah, two is and better. Two for is better permits. just in general. But so let's look at like Deb's Najila list. How does it compare mm -hmm. one versus two there? I feel like he's got to have more ones. Yeah, one is way more. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, one is one is way way more than two for him. And if you look at his, so he has nine permanents with a mana value of one. How many of those are creatures? Do any of them trigger number two? I think most of them. Ragavan. Do nope. Ragavan, and that's it. Well, Lotho. Lotho is not. Lane. Yeah, yeah, but Lotho isn't a, a one. Oh, you mean a, a thing that would trigger? No, no. But I'm talking a one drop thing. If you're if you're putting it on one to hit one drops. Oh, I see. How I many see, creatures would trigger the two? Only Ragavan in in her current suite. Which I mean, other common ones you'll see will be Delighted Halfling, Deathrite Shaman, which he is not on Deathrite Shaman. I didn't realize. Um. Yeah. There's not a ton for for one mana creatures that'll actually give you the two in CDH. Well, but if you look at if you look at two and you look at it from two, right? Yeah. So you got Grim Hireling, Samut, Op Agent, the Revy, uh well, Sam it costs Lotho. three. It, it costs three, but it has a power of two. Okay, you're I, I, yeah, I'm I'm thinking like comparing to how many spells when you look at like the quantity that trigger it on mana value. How many will trigger right, it? Right. But but that's the thing to yeah. keep in mind when it comes to creatures is is anything with two power or, or toughness. two toughness is yep. gonna trigger it as well. For sure. So two still hits everything. Yeah, I mean it even right. hits like, you know, Derevi, Op Agent. It hits it hits Dockside. Right? Yeah, it hits Dockside. <laughs> if they cast the Symbian Spirit Guide, a Grim Hireling at four even. Yeah, it really does does hit a lot. I mean, even if, even if you look at Kinnon, which is obviously full of big baddies, I mean, at the two slot beyond the stuff you're obviously gonna get, um, if you go three and above, Manglehorn hits it, Trophy Mage hits it, Glenelindra hits it, uh, Seedborn yeah. Muse hits it, yeah. Yeah. Two's a good number. But like I said, I could see I could see naming one in a very interactive pot. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, you name two. You name two. I, I yeah. I think I think if I hit a second one, I think I would probably go one and two just to be safe. Make sure yeah, make sense. sure I'm drawing on what everyone does at any point. Yeah, because then you get into those like get into those like uh, stack wars, and and then you have you definitely have the leg up at that point. Absolutely. Yep. Italian's a cool deck. So, what what else? What else is going to come up? Anything else interesting? Uh, I mean, besides that black tutor that was spoiled, which man, that card is 
is broken. <laughs> that card is yeah, so, so good. I think it is the best deck in the format for it is Kirik. Kirik, that is an ultra staple forever in. Uh, and then I think number oh, two yeah. is, I think it's a huge <laughs> pay, boost pay for Dihada. life in one. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but it's, it's a huge boost for Dihada. Sure. Because Dihada has the treasures to bargain it. So it's just, it becomes five mana, put any silver bullet you want to play, Breach, Dockside, Grand Abolisher, Duranith, Oppo, whatever. Just has all of yeah. it. You know, you want to it's going to be quite there. good for Florian too, by the way. Quite good for Florian. Well, is Florian. So, what are your what are you primarily going for with Florian? Is it is it breach combo? Is like plan A? Yeah, breach. It's yeah, it's going to be breach combos. Okay. Uh, it's either breach or bolus of Citadel. It doesn't get Citadel, but it does get everything else related to Citadel. Yep. Like it gets you top. It gets you Aetherflux Reservoir. It gets you, um, you know, any of those pieces. Oh, you are Aetherflux. Every... Oh, oh, definitely Aetherflux okay. is a part of Florian. Yeah. Yeah, it's real good, and and the bargain is great because I uh, you know I'm 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 on the welder and engineer package, so Easy yeah, PG. I'll go ahead and bargain this uh, mana vault that's tapped into the graveyard, and then mm -hmm. bring it back, and now I've got three mana. It's a ritual. Yeah, it can be so an event. It, it can be a legitimate synergy as well as a cost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, feeds the breach. It's it's just great. The card is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, that new Ashiok looks know, and terrible. The, and, and the thing to keep in mind is like everyone looks at it and thinks to themselves, okay. Um, you know, what if I can't pay the bargain cost, or what if I'm getting something that costs more than four? Okay, so it's a four mana demonic tutor at worst case. Yeah, which yeah. which is very bad to be clear. Very very. Which bad. is terrible. Which is terrible. But but you can still do but, it. You can still do it. <laughs> you can yeah, still do you it. You can still yeah. do it. If yeah, you have absolutely. nine mana, it can be an add boss. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's an add nine, nine mana add boss. That's right. That's yeah. right. My conception yeah. of mana values for other decks is so skewed from playing Kinnon because I'm just like untapping with 17 mana on turn three, and I'm like. Ah. What do I do here? Do I play Void when we're Such a luxury. Things? Yeah, it's, it's pretty broken. <laughs> <laughs> Such a luxury. I, I look at that card, I'm like, oh my god, it's four mana. Four CMC. Oh god, that's so much. What the? Uh, yeah, what am I, I going to cut? I got to make some adjustments <laughs> to get my CMC back down. I look at four oh, mana god. and I'm like, oh, easy peasy. Sweet, this is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, it's going to kill me off an Adnaz. Turn yeah. my good Adnaz into a sad Nas. I'll lose the game. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think I've ever, because I've stolen a lot of Adnazes with Perplexing Chimera. I don't think I've ever not hit Void when I'm Adnaz. It's, it's like 100% of the time. 100% of the time. <laughs> That's why I like to look at, you know, Bad Kalia, because Bad Kalia is an Adnaz deck with massive creatures in it. Yeah. He still makes it work. Uh, no, he does. And I, that was honestly, when I was building Omnixilus and I had a lot of questions about higher CMC ad nauseum decks because I was running Citadel and all these cards, which now if you look at even Tim and Jessica, they're on, you know, Citadel, Villas, World Gorger, and they're ad nauseum shell, which they're definitely an ad nauseum deck. Uh, you know, he gave me a conversation where he talked about how ad nauseum isn't just about how, uh, how far you can dig. It's a question of how much mana your deck can create. And so yes. Rock'sai has the advantage of, yes, its curve is really, really low, so we can dig a little, little deeper, and you know, even more so if you're on something like Jets and Luris. But these higher CMC decks, it, you just have to consider what is live in your deck. Do you have the rituals? Do you need to add Nas from seven mana so that your dock side is a live hit to explode there? You know, you don't want to always add Nas with just five mana. Um, so just having an awareness of that if you're in a higher CMC add Nas deck, because you can't always count on the zero mana rocks getting you there. Yeah, yeah. I think Adnaz is there's a little bit more of an art to Adnaz than people realize. I think a lot of people just wanna just wanna jam it, throw it down and, and go for it, you know, main phase, tap out and, and play it. Um, but there's a lot of art to it. Like, you know, considering okay, how many zero rocks do I still have in the deck? You know, can I is it even possible to get there? You gotta think those things through before you just jam it. Um, I mean I think it was that. last night I played Obnixilis. Uh, I mulled to five for a turn two Nas hand, and then I just jammed Ad Nas from 36 life and died. Yep. <laughs> didn't have any mana follow yeah. up. I hit, I, hit yeah. one, I hit one zero mana rock, I win the game. Didn't hit it, you know what I mean? Yeah, well I, I've done that where you go, okay, turn one, I'm gonna play uh, two zero mana rocks, I'm gonna cast a dark ritual, I'm gonna yeah. do, you know, and I, I play my you know city of traitors, I do all these things, and then I cast the Ad Nas. Well, yeah. guess what? I just used up all the things that I need to get with the Adnaz to make the Adnaz work. Yeah. So you need to have mana backup. You, you got to be careful. I probably should have just uh, probably should have just waited. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> when in doubt, end step. <laughs> it was like two a.m. I was I literally like Adnaz <laughs> killed myself and I said, all right, gotta go, guys. <laughs> I, I, I'd be curious to see a chart that shows like Adnaz self death based on hour of play. 
Like <laughs> you get to like two or three o'clock in the morning, there's like a hockey puck effect, which yeah. like skyrockets the sadness. It's just my worse. my buddy, who's the main rock side player, we did an Excel sheet triggering. I actually see it. what what categories do we have. It was yeah, ad nauseum tracker sheet. We didn't really dig into it, but we did um, starting life total, what life he ended on, how many cards he got off of the ad nauseum, how much mana was available when he cast it, did he hit an extra turn spell, and did he win? And what did it show? Oh, we forgot to actually be consistent with it and don't have enough data to represent anything. But <laughs> oh, I think, damn, but I'm so excited. <laughs> but, but like, but like that is a good set of statistics to keep track of. I think those are the categories you want: starting life, ending life, cards you got, mana available when you did it, did you hit the extra turn, and did you win? Yeah, because the, the other problem with that yeah. is, yeah. You know, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go no, ahead. just the the extra turn is like often what those decks are looking for more than anything else. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That that final fortune makes the difference. Yeah. So often. The other thing is, Adnaz often reads, you know, cast this spell, eat lots of interaction, lose to next player. Yes, it does that a lot. But, but it's like when you're playing a turbo ad nauseum deck and you're against a Kinnon deck or a Taib deck or something where you feel like the longer you wait, the more you see your window close, there's that pressure on you to just jam it and see if you can get it because you don't think you win if you wait. Yeah, and it's, and it's true you won't win if you wait. Yeah, well, sometimes yeah, you do, but usually not. Yeah. But it's yeah. pretty funny. I, I told my buddy, he's, he's a lot of tells. Like, a really good thing to look for. If you're against an ad nauseum deck that's waiting, uh, pay attention if they're conveniently holding up two red mana at every point in the cycle. Why? What's the, what's the two red for? Dark side? Final Fortune. Oh. Okay. Just steal yeah. it out. Just steal it out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I used to call him out on it a lot. He got really mad about it. I was like, yo, you have Final Fortune in hand. Don't, don't think you're going to get the chance. And, and then after this, the game, this, he'd be like, hey, he'd be like, how the fuck did you know? And I'm like, you purposefully... This, like, this happened to me the other day. Yeah. Same thing. I, I was holding up the two red, and they called me on it. They're like, yeah, you have Final Fortune. And I'm like, fuck no, me. I don't. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, what are, you, what are you talking about? I don't have it. Okay, he was, he was like Final Fortune. purposefully <laughs> tapping worse things to like leave up a mountain and a red talisman. I was like, come on, bro. Like, <laughs> like you really think I'm not going to yeah. see that? <laughs> I had I had one really good play the other day where I I, I had to tap out like so I tapped out uh, I did Necropotence um, shaped my hand got the Final Fortune hand but couldn't uh, you know couldn't cast it ah. um, but my opponent had uh, the Wondering and they had um, Manifold Key mm -hmm. so um, and I had Simeon Spirit Guide so he went to his he was next in turn order he went to his turn he untapped. He went to use Manifold Key to untap his One Ring, and I deflecting swatted it to a Mox Amber, mm -hmm. and then, and then Final Fortune from there and won the game. Oh, awesome! It was fun. Oh, that's so good. That was a great win. That's, that was <laughs> that that a so great fun. one. Yeah, I think my yeah. my favorite one in recent memory. I finally copied a Final Fortune for the first time ever with One Ring or Kick. Because normally uh -oh. you just you say no to the trigger because theirs will resolve after yours, so they still get the next turn. So copying it doesn't do anything. I was in a position that I was third C and I had Wandering Archaic, Void Widower, and Hallbreaker were out. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was bad. Uh, my buddy was in fourth seat on Dihada, and I like obviously won if I could untap again. I just needed one more turn. So he goes to his turn. Uh, another player had a Dothy, so he portable holds the Dothy, and then he casts a Vin's Reclamation to get rid of the Void Widower. At this point, he has six treasures, and he casts Final Fortune, goes down to four. I go, Wander Archaic Trigger. He goes, sure, copy it if you want. I go, great, I'm actually going to copy it. Uh, does that resolve? And everyone goes, yeah, that resolves. So I get, okay, now that mine is resolved, I'm going to cast Force of Vigor. I'm going to blow up the Touch, I'm going to blow up the Touch of Spirit Realm and the Portable Hole, and the Hullbreaker Horror Trigger. I'm going to bounce Final Fortune back to your hand. <laughs> and then, but then, but then, when he went to cast it again, I said, "There's a void winner. That's two teams. That's two CMC, bro. You can't cast it." Damn, <laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, that's when uh, like you like, as you you got to go like smoke a cigarette after a game like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Rip the vape <laughs> extra hard to go. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. Yes. laughs> Love it, love it, love it, love it. Yeah, I, lo I love the. It's 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 not you know when when you have out twenty three mana worth of bagging creatures or whatever it is like it's not it's kind of hard to fuck up sometimes but like it feels good when yeah. you find the line when they think they have you and then they don't it feels so good. Yeah. So what's uh, what's next for you? Are you planning chaos next weekend? I will be. I will be once again playing on Kinnon. Uh I think I, I previously offered some time pilots, like jokingly, before last mocks, that I would play time if they played my Kinnon list. 
Uh, I think I will redact that offer just in case. I... <laughs> yeah, at this point, it's not a good idea. At this point, out of time, but well, I think I think it's chaos ninety minute rounds or seventy five. I think there's still ninety. So time sure still ninety. Oh, they're they're gonna be out for blood after box. Dude. Oh yeah, they are. <laughs> they're gonna 100%. be. They're gonna really want it. I'm it's gonna, gonna be miserable. miserable. I'll just send them the SpongeBob miserable. hype track. Yeah, it's gonna be really bad. Uh, then maybe I mean I was on I was on Karn for Mox Masters and Karn Karn showed up. Karn has always been the questionable slot that a lot of people ask me in the Kinnon Discord if it's really worth it. Every time you land it, you feel like you win the game. It's it's ridiculous. And if you ask your opponents, like with with these stacks effects that say your thing doesn't work. Like if you have a Void Winnower or a Lavinia or a Karn, any of these cards, and you're wondering how effective they really are, after the game, ask your opponents, how much did this shut you down? And every single time you're gonna hear opponents go, holy shit, that stopped me. Like I couldn't do anything through that card. Um, yeah, it's all, they're hard to evaluate because you don't yeah. feel like they're doing as much as they are during the game. Yeah. Like you're like, oh, I, you know, the card didn't do anything. I'm like, no, actually that won you the game. You yeah. just didn't realize it. You, it's really important to ask. Didn't happen. Yeah, you yeah. don't see the cards they're not casting, um, which makes it seem like it's not doing as much, but it, it really is. It's holding back people a lot. But I'm considering, like if I think time's gonna be coming back with Avengers, maybe I maybe I make the swap back to Soulless Jailer instead of Karn for a tournament. Soulless Jailer is really good against Tyam. It's really, really good. good. I was I was testing those two slots is what I was swapping for the weeks before Mox. I kept swapping between uh, Soulless Jailer and Karn. And if you're against Tyam, Soulless Jailer feels busted. <laughs> yeah, I can't I cannot play Soulless Jailer in Talion because Mean Betrayal is so important in that deck. So I can't that's the oh, one I can't do. That's fair. Um, that's fair. But I can run Weathered Runestone and I can run Graft Digger's Cage, both of which also shut down Tyam. So You could just Sorry. you could just play the Soulless Jailer and get rid of it when it's time. I mean that I mean that's true too. That's the other piece of Talion is it's really important to run a lot of bounce spells and yeah. be able to tempo because you need to you need to bounce your own stuff sometimes too. Well, it also it has the uh, the like Tameshi effect where you, you can use a, a bounce spell just as a filter because if you think they're going to replay that card, you get another Talion draw. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other problem is with Talion is Talion is not a May draw mm -hmm. trigger. So when you go for your Thassa's Oracle line and you do Demonic yeah. Consultation, then your opponent casts a two mana spell and makes you draw a card to lose the game. Yeah. So you have to you have to be wary of that, and you 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 often have to bounce Talion at the end of the game to win. Finally, Fairy Mastermind has a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that card's not good. <laughs> no, it's, it's really it's really not. Orgish Bowmaster is two CMC though. Uh, our Orgish Bowmaster is quite good. Quite yeah, good. it's all right. Yeah, yeah, kills Kinnon a lot. So does it? Not I mean, if you do it right, if you play it I was, right. I was talking to people about this earlier today, dude. When, I, when I'm when i in a position to die to Orgish Bowmaster, because all my stuff is two, so someone has to be getting additional advantage for it to matter, which I think people are past this point with Orgish Bowmaster where they're like, okay, I'm going to feed the Ristic player a card just so they can draw so I can kill someone's dork. Like, people have so realized good. that strategy is not a game-winning strategy. The person who's drawing the cards will win the game. If I go to my Kinnon tracker sheet and I look at the best cards when I'm winning, the top three are Mystic Remore, The One Ring, and Ristic Study. Like, that's not yeah, a coincidence. Number five is Consecrated Sphinx. Card draw wins games. So... Yes, I mean, th think of it this way. <laughs> if, you, if you had a card that said, uh, sacrifice your dork and draw a card, would you do it? There is. It's called Plum the Forbidden. Yeah, but you don't have to actually use a card to do it. You can just do it. You can just do it. Like, it would be a very great ability for every creature to have draw a card on it. Uh, and they don't, yes. because that would be broken as fuck. And Bowmaster is a good thing to exist because it hates on card draw. But when I'm in a position that I'm actually drawing a ton of cards, if I have a Consecrated Sphinx or the One Ring out, I don't fucking care, dude. Kill my kin in. I don't give a shit. I'm just going to draw six cards off my Con Sphinx at least in the cycle, and then I'm just going to recast know when, him. You know you know when Bowmasters is really good? Is against Polymorph decks. Yes, that's pretty funny. Yeah, th those are fun. Those are fun. Yeah. Though honestly, I've just been dunking on Polymorph with Spell Sky for months. Oh, that's <laughs> so rude. Oh, that's so rude. I love it. Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely on Spell Sky in, in Italian, so yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be doing that too. I had a game yeah. against, uh, Play to Win does like the play days where they'll play with their patrons once a month, and I had a game against Cam like a couple months ago where he was on Magda, and he had it set up. Like he had the Artifact Dwarf and Magda and Five Treasures, and he just didn't think right then was the window to go for it because he thought someone had an answer, so he waited. And uh, it went to my turn next, and so... I threw out an unsuspecting Invasion of Ikoria X equals 2, which I figured would draw no interaction there and not make him go for it. And then I put Spell Sky into play and he was like, fuck. 
<laughs> because that, because that, it fucks up the clock combo. It doesn't work. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. So I'm I'm not playing in I'm not playing in the uh, in chaos this, Why not? this month, unfortunately. Uh, my daughter's bat mitzvah at the same time, so I can't exactly. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a hell of a party. There's, um, you, you wouldn't be having, I don't know, exotic cotton candy. <laughs> exotic cotton <laughs> candy vendors, yes. And, <laughs> uh, she's a princess, what can I tell you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the girl gets what the girl wants. You know? Of course. If anyone's wondering what exotic cotton candy is, uh, it, it means you have sprinkled unicorn tears. Just a dusting. <laughs> that's, that's literally what I described. Uh, yes. Yeah, a dusting of phoenix yeah. feathers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's gonna be a good time. But I am going to I'm going to Festival of Nights after that. Uh, up in what is Festival of Nights? Is that a? It's another Eminence event, 160 okay. person, you know, CDH tournament. When is uh, that? In, uh, August 26th. Wait, really? Yep. Oh shit! I'm I'm in the country for that one. Maybe I see, I'm sure it's sold out. I'm I'm not sure. I, I think you. I would take a look. Where are you driving from? Uh, DC. Washington, you wanna, you wanna stop by Ohio? Uh, pick up no. a, pick up a, pick up a Max. <laughs> no, sorry, no. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. That nine and a half hour drive to Atlanta almost killed me, so I don't think I can do that again. How long is the drive to Pennsylvania for you? Like four? It's like, no, it's like three hours. No, it's not bad. It's not bad Piece at all. Piece of cake. It's yeah, in, it's, it's in Pittsburgh. You said, or what part? It's in no, it's it's near Philly. Oh, Philly. How Philly? I think is even farther than Pittsburgh for me. It's like it's got to be like yeah. It's hours. not. It's not close to Ohio. But yeah, yeah, there's no way I'm going to that one then. No way. Yeah, but you're, you're you're but you're coming back stateside, huh? I am coming back stateside. Uh, the Costa Rica journey is ending. Uh, I'm going to be living with my buddy in Columbus, who's like a, a climbing partner of mine uh, for a few months probably. Which it was pretty funny. We didn't talk about time frame, but in our in our conversation the other day, he was just like, "Oh yeah, we should do this climbing trip in like late October." And I was like, "Oh, you're you're planning on me being here a while? Like I'm looking for a job, man." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll but, see how that goes. But are we gonna are we gonna get to see you at some in person tournaments? I hope so. Happen? Yeah, I think I think I'm coming around. I, I'm really hoping to enter some of these like thirty person events where people are winning like five hundred bucks at a wheel of fortune. And I'm just like, what the fuck uh, isn't is that this? crazy? I, I need to find these. I, you know, it never works out for me. I was talking to Timujin today. You played like a you played like a twenty five person event in Colorado and won five hundred dollars. I was like, what? what? The hell? That's crazy. <laughs> like, Crazy. I'm, I'm gonna go pro, just drive around the country and yeah, like play 20 person tournaments and win five hundred dollars each weekend. I know so many people good. who are in these like 30 person events and they're winning dual lands for top fouring, and I'm like, what the fuck? It's insane. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we've covered everything for today. Anything else we're missing? I think that's about the just for now. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I should have the the DDB episode uploaded by long before you guys see this video um to go check that out <laughs> yeah and we should be on a regular cadence hopefully going forward starting next week after the uh giant bat mitzvah is over um and get back on track so oh yeah thanks for joining us thank you for joining us this is colors are a crutch i'm max sternberg also known as wounded satellite and i am max p before you die. we'll see you next time